Good morning. Thanks for coming out this morning. Before we jump into the message, just want to let you know, uh, for the past few weeks we've had in our announcement page that we are working on revising and changing some of our bylaws. And uh, so the copy of that is in the uh, at beginning point. And if you have any questions about that, our elders are going to be in the fireside room after the services today and can answer any of those questions you may have concerning that. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have our congregational meeting, which sounds really exciting, I know, but it's very brief. Uh, and just kind of give an update. And in that, we'll also affirm our leadership for next year and these bylaw changes. Changes. So uh, if you would like, again, uh, we'll have some elders after the service in the fireside room. Well, today uh, we are wrapping up a 10-week series on the Gospel of Mark called On Your Mark. And so 10 weeks sounds like maybe that's a long time, but honestly, for me, it's, it seems like we've flown through it because there are 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark, and the author, Mark, uh, through the testimony of the Apostle Peter, tells us about the life, ministry, teachings, miracles, healings, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so hopefully throughout this series, you've been reading Mark as we've studied it because we've had to skip over some things uh, to try and get through it in 10 weeks. As we've said each of the weeks of this series, Mark is called the action gospel because his writing moves from scene to scene rather rapidly, not going into as much detail as gospels like Matthew and Luke. And so because of this, because this is the action gospel, we're issuing an action challenge to go along with each message. Something specific for you to do in light of what we studied. So last week, the challenge was this, to be praying for an opportunity to share your faith story with someone this week and then do it, then do it. And this is like an ongoing challenge. This is something that we want to continue to challenge you with. Well, I know we've flown through sections of this gospel, but hopefully the Mark's gospel has been either a great reminder or maybe you're hearing for the first time about Jesus' mission on this earth and how he poured into the life of his apostles who would eventually go out and they would change the world. And hopefully, you've also been able to see the love of Jesus in this writing. And today, uh, for the final message, hopefully, you will see even further as we examine how Jesus became a, the suffering servant. Mark's gospel culminates with the suffering of our Lord. So before we read from Mark, I, I want to take a moment to read from a chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah penned these words centuries before Jesus entered this earth and centuries before crucifixion was even invented. Isaiah would prophesy about one who would come and suffer and die for the sins of many. Listen to what Isaiah writes, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. He says, Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a, a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep with, before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an, Lord makes his life an off, offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So again, th this is so amazing, this passage here, the detail of Isaiah's prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus would fulfill these very words. But back to Mark's gospel. So back in chapter 11, uh, we started into the final week of Jesus' life on this earth. Mark would spend the last six chapters of his gospel on this final week of Jesus' life. On Sunday of that week, we had Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On Monday, Jesus came into the temple and he found these money changers taking advantage of people and so he overturned the tables in the temple. On Tuesday, Jesus came back into the temple and he was targeted by the Jewish religious establishment uh, with, with a bunch of questions about his authority. Also on that Tuesday, Jesus would teach in the temple courtyard and as they were leaving the temple, his disciples would comment on the magnificence of the temple complex, which prompted Jesus to begin this discussion about the destruction of the temple that was to take place and talk about what was to take place before his second coming. And so all of that we talked about last week and we were rem reminded through that conversation that we're to be on our guard. We're to be ready for Jesus' return. And so now that brings us to the last three chapters of Mark, Mark 14, 15, and 16. If you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to follow along, you can turn to Mark 14. The scripture references will also be up on the screens. It appears from Mark's gospel that on Wednesday of his final week, Jesus stayed uh, in Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem, to rest, and, and he went to the home of this man named Simon the leper, where this woman, who was known to be sinful, poured perfume over Jesus' head as a symbolic way of anointing him. Well, some of Jesus' disciples weren't too thrilled with what she had done, and it says in verses, verse 4 of Mark 14 that some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold from more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. Now, John's gospel tells us that it was actually Judas who was not very happy about this woman wasting all this expensive perfume. And John adds this about Judas. He said, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Going on in Mark 14, 10, it says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Well, the next day is Thursday, and we know this day as Monday Thursday, not Monday Thursday like I thought my preacher was saying when I was a kid, and I was really confused, like, <laughs> Monday Thursday? Monday comes from a Latin word that means command. And on Monday Thursday, Jesus washed the disciples' feet in the upper room. They ate their final Passover meal together, and Jesus gave them a new Monday, a new command. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And the question I always had about this was, why is this a new command? Like, weren't they always supposed to love one another? What was new about that? Well, the new part was this, where he said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is before the crucifixion. Jesus is telling them, as I have loved you, Peter, as you've seen me loving you, these past three years, love others in the same way. Matthew, you knew that, you know that everyone hated you because you were a tax collector, but I invited you to follow me. As I have loved you, and you've seen that displayed in front of you the last three years, love others in the same way. Judas, you know I know all things. I know what you're about to do. But as I've loved you, and even as I'm washing your feet, so you must love one another. And then Jesus would show them the full extent of his love the next day with his crucifixion. Well, Thursday, this Thursday that this all happened, was also the day when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Thursday is the day of Judas' betrayal. Thursday is this day of abandonment by his disciples. Thursday is the trial and arrest of Jesus. Thursday is Peter's denial. Thursday was a bad day 
on Thursday, Jesus became the suffering servant. And so I want to highlight for us that the suffering of Jesus really came from three sources. And the first source we see is that the, Jesus suffered at the hands of his friends. Of his friends. And some of you know what it feels like to be betrayed and abandoned by friends. Some of you, this has happened even from a spouse. And it's painful. It hurts. You know, it's one thing to be hurt or betrayed by someone you expect it to come from. But from a friend? Well, in Mark 14, this chapter opens with a dinner in Bethany in a home among friends, but it ends with a terrible trial in the hall of the high priest Caiaphas among enemies. It begins with love and warmth and worship, but it ends with mocking and violence and hatred. The beginning of Jesus' suffering came at the hands of his own disciples. And Jesus knew it was coming. Listen to Mark 14, 27. He said, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They all said they wouldn't run. They all said they wouldn't leave his side. But they all ran. Look down at verse 50. Uh, while they were in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying, and he asked his disciples to stay awake with him, and, and they couldn't. They wouldn't stay awake. And then the soldiers came, they arrested Jesus, and Mark says that there was a scuffle that broke out, but after the scuffle, we read this in verse 50. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Just like that, every single one of them ran away. They deserted him, they fled. After all they'd been through for the past three years together, after all that they'd witnessed, after all the times where Jesus poured his life into theirs, they were gone. And that had to hurt. That hurt, had to hurt bad. Of course, it started with Judas. It's interesting that all four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, use this phrase, Judas, one of the 12, to describe Judas. In Mark 14, we see it twice. First in verse 10, it said, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to be betray Jesus to them. And then down in verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, appeared. It's like the writers of the Gospels are making it a point to say, look, he, he was one of us. He was one of us. And then he betrayed Jesus. And to make it even more personal, when, Jesus came up to, when Judas came up to Jesus in the garden, verse 45 says that going at once to G Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. After three years of close fellowship with Jesus, this would be Judas' last earthly encounter with Jesus as he called him rabbi, kissed him, and then that was the signal for Ju Jesus to be seized and arrested. Jesus suffered at the hands of his friends, but it wasn't just Judas. In my opinion, Peter's denial of Jesus may have hurt just as much or maybe even more because Peter was like one in the inner circle, one in Jesus' inner circle, a witness to so much, including the transfiguration, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Peter was the one who spoke up, and he said in verse 31, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Never. And yet, within a matter of hours, he ran away from Jesus. But he didn't run, run far. Mark says, after Jesus was arrested, that Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. And then down in verse 66, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it one time. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. Number two. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you're one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you are talking about. Third time. 
And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Luke's gospel tells us that when Peter denied Jesus that third time, that it, it must have been near to where Jesus was being tried because it says that the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. He saw it happen. Imagine the pain that Jesus must have felt in his heart as he suffered at the hands of his friends. Now, fortunately, we know that Peter came back to Jesus in repentance, as did the other apostles except for Judas, who ended up hanging himself. But Jesus' suffering was only just beginning because Jesus also suffered at the hands of his enemies. So early Friday morning of his final week, Jesus was tied up like a prisoner and led to his formal trial. We know from our study of Mark thus far that the Jewish religious establishment, they, they hated Jesus. They had it out for him from the very beginning of his ministry. They were always watching and listening and questioning, trying to catch Jesus, or saying or doing something controversial, trying to trip him up. So these men who were supposed to be lovers of God and lovers of his word, ones who were supposed to be looking for this Messiah who is to come, ones who were supposed to have a heart for righteousness, actually became enemies of God. And they were willing to sacrifice Jesus' life to maintain their standing, their personal standing. In fact, Caiaphas, the high priest, would willingly admit this in John eleven fifty. 50. He would say, you don't realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. And so what they did is they tied Jesus up, falsely accused him of many things. They spit on him, blindfolded him, punched him, mocked him, beat him. But it wasn't just the Jewish religious elite. There's also Pontius Pilate. So Pilate was the governor of Judea from 26 to 36 AD under the emperor uh, Tiberius. And to his credit, Pilate tried. He tried to release Jesus. He knew he knew that the charges against Jesus were baseless. So three times, Pilate tried to declare Jesus innocent. Matthew's gospel tells us that Pilate's wife even warned Pilate not to do anything to Jesus because she had had a bad dream about him. But though Pilate tried to release Jesus, in the end, he was a coward. He gave in to political pressure. Mark tells us in Mark 15, 15, that wanting to satisfy the crowd, being a people pleaser, Pilate released Barabbas to them instead of Jesus. So he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. So Pilate sold out Jesus to advance his irrelevant political career, a career that would be over in three years. Pilate handed over uh, Jesus over to the Romans to be flogged and crucified, to the Roman soldiers to be flogged and crucified. And, and we've talked about the immense suffering of what a Roman flogging and crucifixion involved. It was beyond inhumane. It was torture and excruciating suffering at its worst. Roman soldiers knew how to take a person to the brink of death and then extend a person's life to put them through even more pain. And so if, if you want to hear a description of the physical suffering Jesus went through at the hands of his enemies, uh, you can go to our website, lvcc.church, and find our series from Philippians called Indestructible Joy, and I preached about it in the message on August 20th. There is the flogging with the cat of nine tails, which was just immense torture. The crown of thorns that were thrust on Jesus' head. The purple robe that they put on Jesus to mock him as royalty because purple was the color of royalty. There was the spitting. There was the beating with the staff, the punching, the mocking, the making him attempt to carry his own cross to Golgotha, the place where he would be crucified. There would be the nails in his hands and in his feet. There would be the raising of the cross into place. And there would be the hours and hours of suffering in agony on the cross. And if all of the physical suffering that Jesus endured at the hands of the soldiers wasn't enough, we also read that the crowds came against Jesus. Back in Mark 15, 11, it says the chief priests had stirred up the crowds to have Pilate release Barabbas instead of Jesus. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. The creator, rejected by his own creation. But not all of his pain was derived from his own creation. 
we also find that Jesus suffered at the hands of God. So there are a lot of verses we could read, but let's turn back to Mark 14. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying, and he said this, Abba, Father, in his prayer, he said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. But as we read in Isaiah 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And I know that sounds really strange, right? That it was the Lord's will to cause him to suffer, but, but this was God's will. Jesus' suffering on the cross had a purpose. It was not just the result of being abandoned by his friends or hated by Jewish, the Jewish religious establishment. It was, it was God's will. It was God's will that Jesus would suffer and die for our sins. Again, the words of Isaiah 53, verse 4, says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. So Jews in the first century believed that if a person was crucified, that person was cursed by God, stricken by him, afflicted, right? But he was pierced for our transgressions. Just a pause here. Why, why would Isaiah use this word pierced? Why would he do that when crucifixion wasn't even invented yet? Isn't that amazing? Hundreds of years before it's even invented. He said, but he was pierced. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. There was purpose behind the suffering. It was the only way to bring us spiritual healing. The Apostle Paul would put it this way in Colossians 2. I love this. He says, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us. Like our sin put us as enemies of God. It stood against us and it condemned us. Our sin condemned us. But then it says, He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. I love that. He took our sin and indebtedness and he nailed it to the cross but it cost Jesus because he was nailed with it. The pain and suffering that Jesus experienced at the hands of God caused him to cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now we read this and we really cannot fully grasp the gravity of this statement that Jesus made. One, one commentator said that Jesus felt the horror of sin so deeply that for a time, the closeness of his communion with the Father was obscured. Some have felt that Jesus' cry of abandonment showed his utter agony in tasting for us the very essence of hell, separation from God. Again, we, we can't fully comprehend this statement, but it was definitely said in agony as he cried out to the Father. And then we read in verse 37 that with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood, stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. And so here we have kind of a completion of the circle when Mark opened up his gospel declaring Jesus to be the son of God. And then here in chapter 15, it's declared once more by this centurion who watched Jesus die as Mark wraps up his gospel. Mark also tells us that as soon as Jesus breathed his last breath, that there was something unique that happened, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So let me give you a little clarification of the significance of this. Inside the Jewish temple, there was this room known as the most holy place or the holy of holies. So to get to the most holy place, you had to go through a, a, another area, separate area, known as the holy place. And separating those two rooms was a thick curtain known as the veil. Essentially, this, this veil, this curtain, shielded a holy God from sinful man because whoever entered into the, the most holy place was entering into the very presence of God. This holy holies, this most holy place, was the most sacred room of the temple because it was God's special dwelling place in the midst of his people. God would actually allow his presence to be in that room in a, in a very special way. So no ordinary person could just enter into this most holy place. In fact, Anyone except for the high priest who would enter into the Holy, Holy of Holies would, would be 
would be put to death by God. God would strike them dead. And even the high priest, God's chosen mediator with his people, could only pass through this veil, pass through this curtain, and enter into this sacred dwelling of God after undergoing a series of meticulous preparations. He had to wash himself with a ceremonial washing, put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let the smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of God. There's this tradition that says that this high priest, before he would enter into the most holy place, would actually take a rope and tie it to his ankle before he entered in, just in case he got into the most holy place and died because no one else could go in and get his body if he died in there, so they would use the rope to pull him out if he would die in there, right? So even after all of this preparation to go into this most holy place, the high priest could only enter the most holy place once a year on a prescribed day called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. But the high priest would also bring blood with him to make atonement for sins. Hebrews 9, 7 says, but only the high priest entered the inner room, that is the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And that, that was only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. And so when Jesus died, it says that this, this veil, this curtain, was torn from top to bottom. Why from top to bottom? It's because this was meant to symbolize that this act came from God above. This was done by God. And when the curtain was torn, this holy of holies, this most sacred, most holy place was exposed, indicating that through Jesus, God's presence was now accessible to all. To all. Isn't that awesome? This is why we don't have priests you know, that we, you know, some of you may come from a different background and you're wondering why I'm not wearing a robe and a funny collar, right? Like, why they don't call me father. I mean, you can, but that's just awkward if you did that. <laughs> um, we, we don't have priests here be, because we don't need a priest to mediate between us and God anymore. We have one high priest named Jesus who makes mediation for us. We have direct access to our Heavenly Father through Jesus. Like I talked about last week, his death was a once and for all sacrifice for our sins. Now, if we had another week, I, I would wait and I would talk about this final chapter of Mark, because, but because I know you guys are really wanting me to get into Christmas uh, series, we're going to finish up today, okay? So Jesus died on a Friday. He was taken down from the cross and put into a tomb that afternoon, the tomb of a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was in the grave the rest of that day Friday, all day on Saturday, and into the early hours of Sunday morning. And then the end of Mark's gospel has women on Sunday coming to this tomb to finish anointing Jesus' body. When the women get to the tomb, the stone that was blocking the entrance of the tomb was rolled away. It was gone. They had worried while they were on their way about, you know, who was, who's going to roll this thing away? It's too heavy for any of us. But when they got there, it was gone. And when they went into the tomb, Jesus' body wasn't there. But they were met by an angel who said this, Mark 16, 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. In other words, he's not laying there, right? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And so this angel gives this declaration of victory. He has risen. He is not here. And this is a fact we not only celebrate on Easter and not only celebrate every Sunday, but we celebrate it every day because it is the crux of our faith, a crucified and risen Savior. And then listen to verse 8, because this is where Mark's gospel really ends. Now, if you're looking at your Bibles, you may notice there are actually more verses after 8. Uh, you probably have verses 9 through 20 in your Bible, and maybe you were looking, at, looking forward to talking about these verses that, that speak about handling snakes and drinking poison, which are in these verses. But if you look, there's a little footnote that says something like this, that the earliest manuscripts uh, and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. This means that someone came along later and added verses 9 through 20. And it was probably because they didn't really like how Mark's gospel ended. Because this is how Mark's gospel ends. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, 
the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's it. It almost seems anticlimactic, doesn't it? Now, we can read from the other three Gospels in the book of Acts what happened after these women went to the tomb. But remember, each of the Gospels has its own unique purpose. And I believe that Mark, he had purpose for ending his biography about Jesus in this very abrupt way. I believe it was very intentional. You see, this entire Gospel has been focusing on the shocking claim that puzzled Jesus' disciples from beginning to end. That is, that the suffering, crucified, and risen Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That God's love and upside-down kingdom were revealed as Jesus died for the sins of the world and rose again. And so the the story ends without closure. We We don't see Jesus in a risen state. It just ends with an empty tomb, the women hearing from the angels to go and tell the disciples and Peter, and they go and they don't say a thing. And so it forces the reader, forces us to grapple with a very strange and scandalous claim about Jesus rising from the dead. And the question is, are you going to run like the disciples did at first? Or are you going to recognize Jesus as your risen king and go and tell the good news? And only you can answer that question. Will you follow Jesus? Yes. <laughs> there will be a nice Christmas gift for you. <laughs> will you follow Jesus or flee and say nothing? The choice is yours. So, on your mark, will you go? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this gospel. Just what a great way for us to understand Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us. And we thank you that Jesus suffered for us. Personally, I, I wish he didn't have to. I wish he didn't have to. But my sin demanded it. Because I couldn't sacrifice my own life to pay the penalty for my sin and bring reconciliation. There's nothing that I could do to save myself. And so, Jesus, I thank you for willingly coming and leaving the glories of heaven, entering this earth, and coming for a purpose. Lord, this time of year, we always want to remember the birth of Christ but that birth came with a purpose that you would come and suffer and die for my sins, for our sins. So thank you for doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Thank you for taking the agony of the cross which you could have willingly walked away from and yet you willingly went to. Thank you for suffering for my sins, nailing my sin and indebtedness to the cross with you and bringing me a restored relationship and a hope of eternal life with, with, with the Father. And so God, may I live, may we live in response to this incredible gift that you've given. May we follow you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.